say. Uh, my name is Alex Shabofsky. Uh, I have the privilege of supporting the First Nations Climate Initiative. Um, the first, we'd like to recognize that we're here on the unceded territories, the Coast Salish peoples, including the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and Musqueam and First Nations, that we're on the west coast of Canada, and that we're in a world cloaked with a climate that's warming, and that threatens all of us, undermining the ecosystems we depend upon every moment of our lives. So thanks for joining us as we start rolling out the progress the First Nations Climate Initiative is making on charting a course to a decarbonized economy in the North, where First Nations people will enjoy the benefits all Canadians are accustomed to, while their communities take up ownership positions in the infrastructure that will be integral to our future. We have an exciting lineup of speakers uh, who I'll introduce to you in a moment. Uh, and inspirational things to hear from all of you, we hope. Um, and, but let's start uh, with one of the leaders that brought the First Nations Climate Initiative together, and that's Crystal Smith, the Chief Counselor of the Heisla Nation. If we could go, go, Chief Smith. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Yesterday, you may have heard me as I spoke to the Heisla story of economic reconciliation and how our interest in economic development cuts a trail towards both an equitable future for Indigenous people and to our net zero future. Our journey has led the Heisla Nation to its Cedar LNG project, built with Heisla values and prioritizes our environment. Cedar LNG is not just the Heisla's opportunity to build a project from the ground up with our vision but it's our chance to show real leadership on the global stage. What happens around the world impacts our territories here, and we are looking forward to development that improve, improves air quality and lowers greenhouse gases in the countries we can serve. This ambition is what drives the First Nations Climate Initiative. This is a collective of like-minded Indigenous partners fighting for these same goals of economic opportunity and a healthier environment. These nations include Lakwalams, Nishka, and Matlakatla First Nation, each of whom are pursuing economic reconciliation for their people in alignment with their cultural values. While each of us are pursuing different ventures, we are unified in our goals of economic opportunity for First Nations. It was nearly two and a half years ago that we came together in the building that each of you are in to announce the formation of the Climate Initiative and our vision through a memorandum of understanding. Since that day, we've been working with our team, a group of leading environmental experts, government and First Nations, to develop a concrete plan based on science and research that shows us how we can make our vision a reality. I'm pleased to, to be here with you today to launch our group's blueprint that outlines the ways we can protect our planet and build prosperity for future generations. This initiative believes in collaboration and indigenous leadership must be at the forefront of a net zero economy. And we are grateful for forums like these hosted by GLOBE that bring us together to share stories, ideas, and solutions and drive global pr progress to fight climate change. You have heard ambitious goals during this forum and our blueprint outlines how we can achieve these goals, together with strong partnerships in all levels of government, industry, and beyond. I believe we can have it all through these collaborations, partnerships, and through embracing Indigenous leadership in the process. This is the work we are doing through the First Nations Climate Initiative. Wah. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Smith. So as, as, uh, as Crystal said, uh, FNC started um, by investigating a relatively simple question. And that question was, uh, is LNG part of the solution or part of the problem with climate change? And uh, the communities such as Heisla and Niska 
have been interested in developing these projects and their communities are very concerned about climate change as we all are. And that began the journey and that simple question turned into multiple initiatives um, that you're going to hear about tonight from many of the collaborators um, with the First Nations Climate Initiative who have stepped up to help uh, the nations and anybody who's prepared to work with them uh, to learn about how to resolve these issues. Uh, so looking forward to, to hearing from everyone and, and just a couple of things we've learned so far. Um, as, as one of the speakers in the previous panel said, uh, natural gas is likely to play a role uh, in the energy transition uh, away from more GHG intensive fuels. Uh, we know that coal to gas switching has played a big role in reducing emissions in the United States and Canada even to a certain extent in China, and there's a lot more that can be done. We also know that if we're going to burn natural gas in the world, and we're going to need to stop doing that soon, um, it should be the cleanest natural gas that there is. Um, and that happens to be produced in Canada, uh, and several of these nations have ambition to produce it in their territories and want it to be the cleanest that there is. And so we can think about it globally, um, but we also have to think about it locally. And we know that uh, LNG Canada is one of the biggest projects in Canadian history. And we also know that it's the largest emitter um, in British Columbia. And so the question is, what are we going to do about that? And how's that going to help us shift to a decarbonized economy? And so answering these questions is what spawned the Blueprint project um, which is to figure out how we could get to where we need to get to from where we are and what we're doing now. And a whole bunch of organizations and companies have stepped up to help us uh, try and figure that out. And that's who you're about to hear from. So the, one of the questions, if you sort of track the discussion we're about to have by way of questions, one of them is how do we reduce the emissions associated with the gas infrastructure we're building and that we already have in place. Because we're going to need to do that. Whether we build any more, and there's certainly ambition to build some more, uh, but how are we going to reduce it to zero and even beyond zero? And you'll hear us refer to beyond zero quite a bit. Um, so Hatch Engineering has been helping us with that question. And uh, Stephanie, one of the climate specialists with Hatch, uh, is going to make a presentation in a moment. And then. We know that however good a job we do at abating those emissions, we're still going to have residual emissions. And so what are we going to do about that? And there's a number of options. We heard from the Prime Minister yesterday that there's a lot of emphasis on carbon capture, utilization, and storage. We're going to be talking about that in June at the conference that we'll hold. Um, but today, FNCI has been focused on nature-based solutions and, uh, and Candice a member of the Heisla Nation and their uh, environment manager is going to be speaking about that. And then the, the question is, we know we need a lot of renewable energy um, in order to not, not just electrify the infrastructure we're building today or that we already have, but to electrify the future. And when you think about the Pacific Northwest, which is relatively poor in terms of the amount of renewable energy available, particularly on the coast, Where's it going to come from and how's it going to get there? And uh, Ron Monk with Kerwood Lytle um, stepped up together with other partners, BC Hydro, a number of other organizations, First Nations Major Projects Coalition, to analyze that question. So where are we going to get that renewable energy from? How are we going to get it to where it needs to be in time for when it needs to be there? And then finally, and not finally, but the last question we're going to talk about today is, well, what happens after 2050? You know, are we going to still be producing natural gas to burn? Or are we going to be doing other things with it? And that's where uh, Rob Seeley from uh, E3 Merge, um, who's got a long history as a consulting chemical engineer and senior person in Shell Canada, and Tyler Bryant with Fortis BC are going to take us down the path towards hydrogen and talk about the different ways that hydrogen is part of the solution and how we can get into hydrogen from where we are today. 
So thank you very much um, for listening to my open. And I'd like to pass it over to Candice um, to start talking, or oh, sorry, to uh, Stephanie to tell us about what Hatch Engineering's accomplished so far. Over to you, Stephanie. And just say, 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 say. Great, thank you, Alex. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie Gangle, and I'm a climate specialist here at Hatch in our climate change practice. Next slide. I'd like to thank everyone for having me here this afternoon. Um, today, I'll go through an overview of what Hatch is doing on the FNCI Blueprint Study for Low Carbon LNG Development in BC. I'd like to note that this work is being done in collaboration with FNCI and other industry collaborators, and we thank them for their participation in this work. Next slide. Here at Hatch, we're well aware of the forces at work on our clients with respect to climate change. And in response, we have a dedicated climate change business practice where we've been delivering project work that covers decarbonization technologies and supporting our clients to meet their climate goals with decarbonization road mapping and climate resilience assessments. Next slide. For this study, we're aiming to identify opportunities to support low carbon LNG development in BC, including potential process efficiencies, such as waste heat recovery, flare minimization, improved operating procedures to detect and address leaks, also clean energy use through renewables and the clean grid, carbon capture and storage, and future incorporation of hydrogen. I'd like to note that for the study, we've remained open to all possible opportunities without restriction by current policy or technology barriers. Next slide. For the study, we're following our common approach for evaluating decarbonization roadmaps, which starts with first developing a greenhouse gas inventory to understand emissions drivers, and then identifying opportunities to reduce or neutralize emissions followed by evaluating opportunities based on cost, risk, and GHG savings potential, and evaluation of pathways which combine different opportunities to achieve a combined GHG reduction over time. Next slide. For this study, we're looking at direct emissions, that is scope one and two emissions, from the assets included here, which are the upstream assets for extraction, the pipeline, and the LNG facility as well. Other downstream emissions in the value chain or emissions outside of the value chain were not considered for this study. In the study, we're considering two cases in the analysis. One is a non-electric facility in Kitimat, um, a non-electric LNG facility that is, and also a, a Prince Rupert case looking at an all-electric LNG facility. Next slide. When comparing a breakdown of the GHG emissions for the two cases, which is shown here, um, for a 14 million ton per annum production capacity, we see a big reduction in greenhouse gases overall for the electric LNG facility. And that leaves the bulk of GHG emissions um, at the upstream assets, which were assumed in the study to be non-electric. Next slide. In decarbonization, the hierarchy followed is to seek first to eliminate or avoid sources of emissions through things like electrification and use of clean power through renewables or bioenergy, and then reduce remaining emissions as much as possible. And finally, neutralize residual emissions that cannot be reduced completely through things like nature-based solutions or other negative emissions technologies. Each area of the hierarchy has different opportunities that can be considered and are being looked at as part of this work. Slide. So looking at the upstream assets, we see the majority of GHG emissions arrive from, arise from power generation through the combustion of natural gas at the non-electric upstream assets. This is a focus area for opportunities at the upstream, such as electrification to the cleaner power grid or addition of renewables via microgrids or other low emissions power generation technologies. Slide. At the pipeline assets, we see that fugitives are a larger driver of those emissions. 
Fugitives are a focus area for many operators already, as the government and private sector are targeting steep reductions in methane emissions through improved monitoring and digital solutions. Next slide. And finally, at the LNG facility, which showing here is the all electric case, we see the biggest driver for GHG emissions are the incinerators, which are very challenging to eliminate as an emissions source completely. This will be a focus area for technologies like carbon capture and storage, along with opportunities in nature-based solutions or other negative emissions technologies to neutralize the residual emissions from these hard to abate sources. Slide. In conclusion, we can draw some key takeaways, including that the LNG value chain from the upstream assets to the port is very energy intensive and a large capacity of clean energy will be needed to enable net zero LNG development by 2050. Also distributed small sources of power generation and consumption at upstream assets and the pipeline make electrification in these areas a challenge. Nature-based solutions and other negative emissions technologies will be needed to neutralize hard to abate emissions and therefore will play an important role in achieving net zero. Finally, this is a complex problem with no silver bullet, but many potential decarbonization opportunities exist. Close stakeholder collaboration will be needed to decarbonize the full value chain by 2050. Thank you again for having me here today. I will now pass it back to Alex. Thank you very much, Stephanie, and thank you to Hatch Engineering for all of the work that you've done on behalf of uh, FNCI and all the other others that have been collaborating together with the nations. And as you've said, we can squeeze as hard as we can to reduce those emissions but there's a residual amount and nature-based solutions is one of the solution paths to deal with those and neutralize those emissions. And so to speak to that, we have uh, Candice from the Heisler Nation. Thanks, Candice. Thanks, Alex. So it's been two years <laughs> since being in person and um, as Elizabeth mentioned yesterday, it's so great to be here in person. Um, and so if I, if I stumble a bit, that's why. <laughs> um, but I, I would like to say I'll, I'll let my shoes do the talking. <laughs> um, so yes, um, next slide. So I'd like to um, provide a quick overview of my presentation. Um, I'll start with an official introduction, then I'll display a map to give context of where we are situated within the province. I will then review the list of Indigenous nations included in nature-based solutions. And then I will transition to the impacts that we are working towards fixing and how it is connected to climate change. I will then transition to the impacts that we are working towards fixing and how it's connected to climate change and th with the cultural values uh, that are connected to nature-based solutions. So as a cultural practice in Heisla, um, to properly introduce yourself, um, it's to allow people who are listening so they can understand your place in society and the community. I'm a proud Heisla member, as well as uh, the, the roots I have in Nishka. I've listed my educational background, and I'm currently the Environment Manager for Heisla Nation Council and the Technical Representative for Heisla on FNCI. So this map uh, shows where the FNCI nations are located. We are on the Pacific North Coast of the province. At the north, about a third of the way down is the Nishka. Uh, just to the south is Metlakatla, and just a bit farther south is, is Heisla. And within the Nature-Based Solutions Steering Committee, we have a number of nations who are interested in developing nature-based solution projects. Those include uh, three Treaty 8 nations, Halfway River First Nations, Soto, and West Moberly. 
and I'll go back to the previous slide. So they're in the, um, the northeast corner of the province. And then we also have two carrier nations, Stilaco and Saikus, and they're in the central portion of British Columbia. I'm, I'm a visual person, so I believe that a picture is worth a thousand words. So these, the next portion of my presentation will go in towards, will highlight the impacts that we are trying to mitigate. And I will use specifically the Heisler projects to highlight the types of restoration we are prioritizing in our traditional territory. The photo on the left is from approximately 1970, and it depicts the state of the Kitimat River Valley. The lack of strict forestry regulations allowed companies to harvest right to the banks of the streams in our traditional territory. Fast forward to the present day and the aftermath of forestry companies doing business in our territory. The natural regeneration of the riparian areas do not allow for stability of the banks, therefore not allowing the stream to reestablish a rich ecosystem. So the picture on the right uh, is of the Nalabila stream, so one of the smaller streams in our traditional territory. And you can see that the banks are not stable and we're, we're trying to mitigate that. And with an already dynamic freshwater system, it is further impacted by more intense and more frequent high water events due to climate change. Given these extreme impacts on the watersheds, Heisler Nation Council has taken it upon themselves to implement riparian restoration projects. The photo on the left is an example of prescriptions and shows the riparian vegetation types that require restoration. And the photo on the bottom shows the final outcome we are aiming for, which consists of a mix of coniferous and cottonwood species. This particular species mix will provide long-term stability in the banks of creeks, in turn allowing the stream ecosystem to establish a productive output. And the photo on the right is just another photo of um, the destruction that we are trying to, trying to fix. The riparian restoration projects can be labeled as nature-based solutions, people working with nature, indigenous nations making taking ownership over the past mismanagement of ecosystems. There are many co-benefits of these projects at all levels. The aim is to provide flood and erosion control in the impacted watersheds. As a result, it will allow for a healthy return of salmon stocks to our traditional territory, equating to food security. The riparian restoration projects have been providing meaningful seasonal employment for community members who prefer to be out on the land rather than in labor construction jobs. This is a photo of the motivation behind implementing nature-based solutions, both personally and professionally. Every year I work on our traditional foods. I usually have my daughter helping and so having that as a cornerstone of our culture is the motivation to pass this on to the next generation coming up. So these are ulican hanging in my smokehouse uh, from a couple weeks ago. Uh, the ulican run comes in March slash April and it's, it signifies a new, a new year. So from the, the Nishka side, we have um, a celebration called Hobie, which is the Nishka New Year. Traditional harvesting and processing, as I mentioned, is, a, is the core of our culture. And this is a photo of um, my smokehouse with salmon in it. Preservation of our culture is top priority and nature-based solutions is a secondary benefit in doing so. First Nations Climate Initiative is working towards engaging more Indigenous nations in nature-based solutions and this photo depicts uh, a land-based mammal, mammal traditional harvesting and processing. I believe that's moose in a smokehouse. And that's it. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Candice, uh, for reminding us that, um, among other things, uh, nature-based solutions um, aren't about developing carbon sinks uh, from a First Nations perspective. Uh, they're about recovering the capacity of the ecosystems in their territories um, to provide food security in the way in which uh, Candace has just illustrated. And many of the nations involved um, see it the same way. Um, at the same time, we are uh, trying to connect um, the global marketplace in carbon with the opportunity uh, for these nations to develop uh, nature-based solutions with the kinds of benefits that Candace has just spoken to while also sequestering carbon. And so uh, I just wanted to ask well, one of the people that's been helping uh, with the NBS project uh, is Alistair Handley uh, with um, Radical Balance from Alberta, uh, who's a carbon trader. Just to add, add a few things to what Candace has said in terms of providing the, the interface with the global carbon market and what's going on. Go ahead, Alistair. Thanks. Is this on? There we go. Uh, Alistair Hanley, thanks for the opportunity. Alex, uh, hello everybody. It is great to be in person. I think what's really, really interesting about this opportunity is how it can benefit from carbon markets, not only in Canada, but international markets as well. And if you're not familiar with carbon markets, to provide just a bit of context, when we look at the major registries that we think about, the American Carbon Registry, Climate Action Reserve, American uh, Gold Standard, and Vera, 1.3 billion, almost 1.4 billion carbon credits have been developed in those registries since they first came into being. And you get to add on to that credits developed under the Clean Development Mechanism, which I think takes us up to about 4, 4.5 billion credits since 1990. The Mark Carney Task Force on Scaling Voluntary Markets, just voluntary markets, has suggested we need 2.7 billion credits in 2030. The demand is astronomical. And today there's money flowing into projects around avoided deforestation and restoration in Africa, in South America, in Indonesia. And now we're going to have this opportunity to invest in projects in Canada to restore these vital ecosystems and provide First Nations with some control over these resources. And I think it's an incredible opportunity for both investors and for the country as a whole. And if you don't think that people in Canada, investors in Canada don't understand this, over $600 million in the last 12 months or less has flowed into carbon streaming companies in Canada that are looking to invest in projects like this to finance these activities. And of course, let's be honest, driven not only by the benefits, but the opportunity to profit from it as well. And it's that balance, this market mechanism, that's gonna enable projects like these or assist projects like these and, and help move them forward. So with that, I'll turn it back to the smart people to talk and have a seat, thanks. Thanks, thanks very much, Alistair, and uh, we will be uh, throwing it open for questions and comments from everyone. Uh, I just wanted to uh, give uh, give you the opportunity to hear the integration of that market with the uh, indigenous uh, base that's build, building these nature-based solutions up. Uh, going back to uh, Stephanie's presentation for a second, we know we don't get all the way there um, uh, with abatement. We can see that nature-based solutions is a huge opportunity uh, and that will sequester carbon, both through the protection of ecosystems and the restoration of those ecosystems. But we need a lot of renewable energy. And I mentioned earlier uh, that Kerwood Lytle has uh, taken the lead um, on a project on behalf of FNCI, uh, working with BC Hydro and, and others. Uh, and Ron Monk is here to tell you about it. So over to you, Ron, thank you. Well, thank you very much, Alex. It's an honor uh, to be on the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, Nation traditional territory, unceded traditional territory, and to work um, with the Haisla, the Metlakatla, the Lakwalams, and the Nishka 
on this um, on this very interesting project, and um, I'm sure that uh, other other uh, indigenous communities will will join this project in the future. Um, so I was asked to look at a electrified, uh, liquefied natural gas scenario for Northwest British Columbia. It is a, um, an aggressive scenario in terms of its size. Um, it's a scenario that is over 50 million tons per annum of liquefied natural gas. Lots of people in the room won't know what I'm talking about when I say that. It would require um, 3,200 megawatts of electricity, 28,000 gigawatt hours per year. Um, so that, to put that in context, um, BC Hydro's Site C project is about 1,100 megawatts, 5,000 gigawatt hours per year. The entire BC system is, peaks at about 12,000 megawatts. So this is a massive uh, scenario that would involve five or six uh, large liquefied natural gas facilities. Uh, to put this in context with the Heisla Pembina Cedar LNG project, um, the amount of electricity that that facility needs is about 200 megawatts. Um, and these are uh, facilities that would be electric drive. What we mean by that is that the refrigeration systems that are involved uh, in compressing gases to cool the methane down to where it turns into a liquid, that those would be driven by electric drive motors and that um, that electricity would be renewable. Um, if you want to have a net zero liquefied natural gas, you really need to have let net zero energy serving it. Um, the energy to serve or the electricity to serve a liquefied natural gas plant needs to be very, very reliable um, because disrupting um, the, the liquefaction process is very disruptive to the process and would require flaring of methane or natural gas um, if it's disrupted. Um, so this, this slide here gives you an indication of, of the, um, the scenario. I have about 10 slides and I'm gonna flip through basically the renewable energy opportunities in British Columbia, what they are in Northwest BC, and how this opportunity could be solved with renewable e energy um, storage and transmission. So BC is fortunate in terms of having an abundance of renewable energy resources that have not yet been developed. A lot of renewable energy resources have been developed and most of um, BC Hydro and Fortis BC's electric system um, is served with renewable electricity. Large hydroelectric, wind, biomass, um, and, and other renewable sources. Um, we haven't put all the renewable sources on this map, but this gives you an indication of the massive amount of um, untapped renewable, um, renewable energy uh, and storage in, in British Columbia. I'm gonna zoom in on the Northwest in a moment and you'll get uh, a little more indication of what, what the opportunities are there. So this is a table that lists um, some of the renewable energy op opportunities in Northwest BC or North Coast BC. Um, they include wood waste, onshore wind, offshore wind, uh, runner river hydro, geothermal, and pump storage. And there are others like solar and, and ocean energy. And we haven't included those in the list because um, I personally don't think at this time those are really part of the solution. I think the solutions are on this list and in transmission. Um, by far the most cost effective resource is onshore wind in Northwest BC and it suffers from being intermittent. When it's not windy, you don't get wind energy. And so the idea is that probably needs to be coupled with transmission and or uh, pump storage or a store, uh, hydroelectric with storage. One of the things that's really interesting about wind 
uh, wind energy is the costs have dramatically declined over the last few decades. Um, if the, these, uh, this cost fraction is in real dollars, what that means is inflation is taken out of the picture. And if you look at this chart, you can see that the cost to build a wind energy project in most places of the world is about 25 to 30% of what it was a decade ago. So wind energy is one of those technologies, resources, where the cost is declining. And that's not true of very many things in the world these days. But it's true of a couple other things. Solar energy costs are declining rapidly, but Northwest British Columbia is not a very solar rich place. So whereas it is a wind rich place, it is a water rich place. Battery costs are also declining rapidly. And it, as is hydrogen technology and hydrogen, hydrogen can be used for storage. Um, so I've got similar cost curves for lots of technologies, but I only have seven to 10 minutes here, so we're gonna move on. Costs are declining on certain, certain technologies. So wind is part of the answer here. This is a supply curve. The economists will get this. How this curve works is basically if you, um, it shows um, by least cost to most cost, what the onshore wind energy projects would cost as you buy more and more projects. And so typically you have the lowest ones over on the left that are about $35 a megawatt hour. So that's about three and a half cents a kilowatt hour. And if you're, if you're paying a power bill in British Columbia right now, you're paying about 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So the cost of building a new wind project is about a third of the cost of uh, what you're paying as an end customer to BC Hydro today. Now, an important consideration is this is the at site cost. And so there's transmission and distribution infrastructure required to get that to your home. Only transmission infrastructure required to get it to an LNG plant. But that will add a few dollars a megawatt hour depending on the location to get it to the LNG site. And you can see here that there is, um, you know, almost, well, there's over 10,000 gigawatt hours of wind energy that can be developed in the northwest of BC. That's, that's how much wind has been identified. And remember from earlier on, I said we were looking for 28,000 gigawatt hours in this ambitious scenario. So the point is, there's a lot of wind energy that could be developed in northwest British Columbia and it's cost effective. So, but it's intermittent. So we're gonna need some storage or some transmission. These are the pump storage opportunities in Northwest British Columbia. And these are some of the best pump storage opportunities in the world with, with high elevation alpine lakes. And high elevation lakes um, will typically have um, low aquatic value. It needs to be assessed, but um, pump storage is a proven and um, identified opportunity for Northwest British Columbia. So we, we built a couple of scenarios of how this load could be, could be served. Again, it's a huge, huge load, over 3,200 megawatts and 28,000 gigawatt hours. And so we figured, a thousand megawatts of onshore wind in this scenario, 2,000 megawatts of offshore wind. Offshore wind is more expensive because it's more expensive to build the structures that the wind turbines need to be placed on and to build the subsurface cables to connect to the land base. Um, we included a high voltage DC cable to connect uh, northeast BC to northwest BC and that had 2,000 megawatts of capacity. Um, and there is abundant capacity in um, generation in Northeast BC existing and under construction with the 1,100 megawatt Site C project coming on in a couple years. Um, we also included some hydro storage in the area. Um, there's a, um, and, so, and 500 megawatts of, of uh, pump storage near Prince Rupert 
and uh, another 1,000 megawatts at another location. And then this is a map that sort of shows this, uh, this idea. Um, so there's an existing single 500 kV cable, uh, a transmission line, overhead transmission line that runs from Prince George in the, near the center of British Columbia to, uh, to Terrace. And um, in, in one scenario here, we've shown a second dash line beside that. So that's an option, build another 500 kV line. We've shown a, a 500 kV loop running from Terrace to Prince Rupert up to the Nass Valley and uh, New Ianch, the Nishka Territory, and back down to Terrace so that the um, potential LNG plants that need to be located on the coast for loading the LNG onto ships um, so that those, those facilities could be linked with uh, basically um, a loot um, transmission uh, system and a dual feed to Terrace which will provide the type of reliability that's needed for these types of plants. If you look at the little graphics um, on, the, on the chart, you can see an abundance of offshore wind um, in the Hecate Strait between, um, between Prince Rupert and Haida Gwaii, um, the Haida Territory. There's an abundance of uh, wind projects um, in, the, in the Heisla areas and in the Wet'suwet'en territories. Um, Further, further east of, uh, of Kitimat. There's geothermal potential in the area. There's hydroelectric potential in the area. And there's biomass potential. And those are all shown on this chart. And I, I don't have the time to spend much more time on that chart. Other than to mention um, the, the dash dotted line across the top is a possible high voltage DC cable um, that could be buried in a um, natural gas transmission line right away. And you don't do that with alternating current because of induction. You can ask me later about induction if you're not technically knowledgeable what that is. But you don't want to mix high voltage AC and gas pipelines because it's bad news for, for both. Um, but direct current is fine. And so burying uh, a, a double pole direct current transmission line in near the transmission, the gas transmission right away is a good idea. There's other problems with DC is that um, you basically need a converter station, an inverter station, uh, if you're gonna serve a, a motor load off that. And so if you wanna say serve a pipeline compressor off a DC line, you're gonna to need to build an inverter to go from DC to AC to be able to serve the motor in most cases. So what are the, um, so it was actually, they actually asked the engineer to talk about some policy opportunities and so I've listed a few, a few of them. One of them is First Nation ownership. First Nation ownership of the renewable energy opportunities. First Nation ownership of the power transmission um, uh, opportunities we're talking about here. First Nation ownership of the um, gas transmission line, which is what is happening now for, for Coastal Gas Link. New policies to encourage building transmission in advance of need. The policy in British Columbia right now, basically BC Hydro needs a firm commitment from a customer before they can um, basically do an investment decision to build a transmission line. Transmission lines take a long time to build, and so those two, those two situations don't work because it might take a decade to build a new 500 kV line from Prince George to Terrace. How do we break some eggs to get some chickens going before in time to, uh, to serve these loads? Um, some support for renewable energy development. Um, one of the challenges that exists right now is that, um, you know, BC Hydro hasn't done a call for renewable energy since 2008. Um, there is a need for more renewable energy in Northwest BC. Maybe there should be a targeted call for power and storage in Northwest BC. BC Hydro is in surplus in terms of its overall 
province of BC situation, but likely a shortage coming in Northwest BC. Um, there needs to be integration with, uh, with British Columbia's climate plans and Canada released a new climate plan yesterday. It's 271 pages, so I haven't read it all yet. Um, this First Nation Climate Initiative plans needs to be integrated with those. And there needs to be the recognition, this is super important and Alistair will have comments on this. Um, it's important that um, it be recognized that net zero LNG produced in Canada or British Columbia in, in the territory of these nations, if it's displacing coal fire generation in other parts of the world, it is a part of a climate solution. So um, proving that and getting the credit for that under what I believe, correct me, the policy people correct me, I believe it's Article 6 of the Paris Accord is how you would go about that. I understand that's very complicated, um, but that's an important step in this. So those are my slides. Back to you, Alex. Thank you, Ron. Um, key takeaway from that, all of those points are, are great, and from an FNCI perspective, we need to build that infrastructure. Whether we build any more LNG plants or one more, however many, that, that renewable infrastructure is key, and we can't do it reactively. We need to do it proactively. Just like on the nature-based solutions, there's a huge opportunity to invest in restoring First Nations territories and protecting the ecosystems. We need to make that happen by ensuring the policy environment is conducive. So now we're, imagine we're at 2050, we actually got to net zero uh, and we've, we've uh, neutralized the, the carbon emission or the, the CO2 emissions, the other carbon emissions from the, this infrastructure. And where, what are we gonna do with the gas? Where are we going? What are the options out there? And to introduce us to these ideas, many of you already share them. Uh, we have uh, Rob Seeley, um, who's joining us virtually, and Tyler Bryant. So over to you, Rob. All right, thanks, Alex. Um, yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to speak uh, about hydrogen, provide a snapshot of what is hydrogen, how do we make it, what can we use it for, what kind of contribution can it make to a net zero future? And then also, how can we leverage existing infrastructure, things like natural gas pipelines, LNG facilities, large transmission grids to, um, to enable the, uh, the hydrogen potential in the net zero future? Um, next slide, please. Let's start with hydrogen. It's actually not an energy kit. It's an energy carrier, it's not an energy source. And that's because on Earth, unlike the sun, it doesn't, it doesn't occur in its natural state. We have to manufacture it from either water or a hydrocarbon, and the most common one we manufacture it from is methane, or better known as natural gas. Uh, it burns, however, it burns without carbon emissions. Uh, it packs a relatively good energy punch by mass, and at the same time, storing and transporting hydrogen is challenging, and it's due to the pressures and the metallurgical needs of storing hydrogen or trans transporting it in pipelines. Next slide, please. Okay, so what do we use this stuff for? Um, the big thinkers called the International Energy Agency and many other um, energy um, groups are saying that hydrogen could enable 15 to 20 percent reduction in GHG emissions globally. So we'll translate that to nationally and provincially by 2050. And what do we use it for? We use it for transport, we use it for heat, and we use it for chemical feedstocks. On the transport side, very important to note, it is for heavy transport. This is trucks, buses, off-road equipment, ships, possibly aviation. It's not for your SUV and your sports car. Those things should run on EV and battery technologies because they're light enough. But when you get into the heavy vehicles, we need some other technologies. And hydrogen can be a fuel for hydrogen fuel cells 
or direct combustion, but that's where it fits in the transport sector. On the heat side in industry, we need we would use it in the hard to abate sectors. And one of a great example is the steel industry. We need high thermal temperatures, something that really packs a punch. And uh, hydrogen would be a perfect um, application for that for a, a low carbon hydrogen. And then in chemical manufacture, we often make chemicals from hydrogen and something else. So we can make hydrogen and CO2, we can make methanol, we can make ammonia, we can make, and they become the building blocks for even more chemicals. So hydrogen becomes a feedstock in the value chain for the chemical process, low carbon chemicals in the future. So those are the three main themes on hydrogen use. Next slide, please. Um, okay, so how do we make it? Let's start with electrolysis. This is uh, well known that we would use electricity and we would separate a hydrogen and oxygen atoms from water. So uh, the key here is we have to use renewable electricity. So we don't emit carbon when we manufacture this hydrogen. And then we have, would have hydrogen as our product. We would have oxygen as our byproduct. Uh, the second method is what's being done mostly today in industry is called steam methane reforming of natural gas. So you think of that CH4 molecule, we're going to strip all those hydrogens off that one carbon uh, and have the two hydrogen molecules. We're left with CO2, unfortunately, in this process. So then we need to use carbon capture and storage to compress and uh, sequester that CO2 byproduct stream. That's for steam methane reforming. And then the third low carbon method of producing hydrogen is an exciting new technology called pyrolysis. And pyrolysis, again, we're using natural gas, but this time we're using natural gas with renewable electricity. We're putting the gas into a high pressure reactor at high temperature, and we are stripping the hydrogen from the carbon molecule to produce the hydrogen. And what we're left with is a solid carbon waste. And this is often as dust. So it's a solid carbon waste as dust, which could then be used as other um, as inputs to other um, value-added products. And we're gonna talk about that in a minute. So that's pyrolysis. Next slide, please. So hydrogen by pyrolysis of natural gas. One of the keys here is we talked about electricity, renewable electricity for electrolysis, renewable electricity for pyrolysis. But in the case of pyrolysis, you'll see on the chart on the bottom right, the amount of electricity needed is 75% less than what's needed in water, electrolysis of water. So that in itself is a huge uh, advantage in that it's gonna be a massive reduction in cost because most of the cost of making hydrogen by electrolysis is in the cost of the power. Uh, the second important factor here is when we do uh, pyrolysis of natural gas to make hydrogen, we actually have a very low carbon footprint. And that's the chart on the left. And it's the third little bar, the turquoise bar. You can see it's almost zero. Uh, it is not a zero carbon process, but it is very low carbon, lower than um, steam methane reforming with CCS. And, um, and then I think there's, those are the two major advantages, essentially cost and electrical inputs and a very low carbon footprint with the pyrolysis. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the first commercial scale project, which is now in operation in Nebraska. Next slide, please. So this project was built by Monolith um, Inc. in Nebraska. It is a hydrogen, a commercial scale hydrogen plant that produces hydrogen and this carbon black material. It is fueled, it, its feedstock is natural gas and electricity from renewable power. And so that's the key. Otherwise, we're um, we're not going to have uh, low carbon hydrogen. The solid carbon waste from this project is used for the manufacture of tires, but it could also be used in many other products. We could think of carbon fibers. We could think of uh, anodes, cathodes for electrolysis for heavy industry. These kinds of things. Um, one of the other key advantages is you're using natural gas infrastructure to deliver the feedstock for the plant. So when you're thinking about, we wanna move the hydrogen molecules as natural gas a long way, 
we move them through our natural gas pipelines to the point where the hydrogen is needed. And the, the monolith project has had a, uh, a little over a year successful operation coming up on two years possibly. And they've just recently secured a $1 billion loan from the US government for a major expansion of this plant. So it will become, instead of a 5,000 ton per year plant of hydrogen, they're expanding it to 50,000 tons per year. So a 10 times expansion is being planned for this, this project. Next slide, please. So what about uh, developing hydrogen infrastructure for BC? Well, the experts are saying we should develop these hydrogen projects around hubs, around ports and industrial complexes. We could think of the Port of Vancouver or Kitimat, Rupert. We could think of Prince George as an industrial complex, but these are the kinds of places where these hydrogen projects should be developed. And then what kind of hydrogen should we be producing? Well, that depends. It depends on the resources of that hub and area. Do you have good sequestration potential? Do you have good renewable power supply? Do you have natural gas supply that you could use? These are the things that will de decide it. So you shouldn't be picking winners and losers on the type of hydrogen manufacturer. It, the, the type of infrastructure and geology will dictate what's, what, could be, what, could be, uh, what technology could be used for manufacture. And when we talk about distribution of hubs, I mentioned that transportation and storage was challenging. Hydrogen pipelines are a possible. It's a special metallurgy that's needed for transporting hydrogen. It's a high, it's a stainless steel metallurgy. So one would think this kind of um, pipelines should be in for, for more local distribution, not long distances. A long distance stainless steel pipeline is gonna be very expensive. So for long range transport, we should think about continuing to move it as natural gas in the ex infrastructure that we have today and then convert it to hydrogen at the location or hub that it's needed uh, through the technologies uh, available, whether it's pyrolysis or steam methane reforming with CCS. Next slide, please. And when we think about moving it off the continent, we need to think a little bit differently. Um, we hear about people uh, proposing to make manufacture large volumes of hydrogen and ship it around the world, but there are also projects talking about, well, we should actually convert it to methanol or ammonia and, and, and ship it uh, in that form that it's more efficient. And so that brings us back to this little chart here, a very important chart for intercontinental transport, and that is energy density. And we need to think about the energy density of, of what we're transporting. And so we start on the left with compressed hydrogen and then, and then liquid hydrogen is next, and then methanol and then ammonia. And then liquefied natural gas is actually almost to gasoline in terms of energy density. So one might think, well, we can continue to use our LNG terminals in Kitimat, uh, move that LNG as uh, liquefied natural gas to uh, a country that wants it. And if they want to convert it to hydrogen, that makes the most sense for them to do it either by pyrolysis uh, or by steam methane reforming if they have suitable subsurface. So, so that's an important factor on intercontinental transport. Next slide, please. And then let's just think about the ports of Kitimat, uh, Prince Rupert, and what will these ports look like in the future? Will they be low carbon energy hubs, both trans manufacturing and transporting low carbon energy sources around the world and manufacturing low carbon energy sources for our country? And so I think that potential is very much there. If it starts with LNG today, which is being built in Kitimat, uh, world scale LNG, then why couldn't we use some of that gas to make hydrogen through uh, either with pyrolysis technology and or we could use uh, surplus renewable energy in the region and manufacture hydrogen from water and produce, produce it from uh, using electrolysis. And then once we have the hydrogen there, whether we're using it uh, locally, domestically, or shipping it internationally, um, we could also manufacture other low carbon energy products such as methanol or ammonia, which could be shipped uh, domestically uh, or uh, shipped internationally. So, we'd be, so these ports then become 
tend to build on the infrastructure that we're building today rather than us thinking about, oh, the infrastructure we're building today is obsolete. No, the infrastructure we're building today is laying the building blocks for the infrastructure of tomorrow. Anyways, that's, uh, that is my talk on hydrogen and happy to take some questions a little later. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rob. And uh, uh, I'm sure that was enlightening to a lot of people and, and many of you already know the hydrogen story. Um, one might ask, well, what's actually happening with respect to hydrogen? And uh, that's one of the reasons that we invited Tyler, who's been a real supporter of our work, um, to speak today uh, because he's spearheading uh, Fortis's investigation and, and actual implementation of new hydrogen projects. Over to you, Tyler. Can I? Can I? Yeah. Somebody's on the on the ball there. That's great. Um, <clears throat> so again, I'd like to just echo what Candice was saying about. It's great to be back in person and see my people, our people, uh, energy, climate policy stuff. It's great. I um, I decided, I don't know why I did this, but I was saying, oh, two years, um, I'm, people are going to see a lot of slides, so I'm just, I'm not going to use slides, but now I'm realizing it's like driving around without Google Maps or something. I don't have a, don't have a crotch here, so I'm just going to give some remarks uh, about what we're up to um, at Fortis BC and to maybe just give you a, a message of hope and opportunity and and really uh, and re really of ex excitement excuse me uh, of the partnership opportunities that we see to both produce renewable energy and to partner with indigenous communities across the province and others and so um, <clears throat> so Fortis BC I'm, I'm remiss to just not mention that Fortis BC is the largest energy uh, delivery company in the province, so we deliver more energy than anyone else, that includes BC Hydro. So just a major part of the province's energy infrastructure backbone, and you know we have about 50,000 kilometers of pipelines, uh, over 7,000 kilometers of wires and poles in our electric service territory as well, we're both a gas and electric utility. And uh, in that capacity, you know, our infrastructure delivers energy to about 135 communities, and that includes uh, 57 and soon to be 58 indigenous communities in the province. So the, 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 most, the newest one that we're going to hook up is the Wiwaikai in um, Campbell River, and there's a, a, a more plans from there on in, maybe with the semi Amu. And so, um, you know, we, we have a large role in just delivering energy to those communities, but also because our infrastructure spans the province, uh, it, it obviously overlaps with over 150 different traditional territories across the province. And so, you know, it's, it's a big role, a big responsibility we have. You know, we have a lot of uh, touch points, a lot of engagement with uh, Indigenous groups. And, you know, we, we really want to, we really are striving to, uh, to reach authentic and respectful engagement and relationships with Indigenous groups across that province. And, <clears throat> you know, we see that as, you know, essential towards reconciliation. We see reconciliation as, you know, of high benefit, not just to the Indigenous communities in this province, but to all of our customers. And, you know, we're, we're, we're highly aware of the challenge of the imperative to, um, to reduce emissions, to align ourselves with a net zero carbon future. You know, we haven't set a net zero target yet, but we, we are looking, evaluating pathways. We recognize that deep emission reductions need to be made, and that needs to be done in an equitable and just way. And that involves striving to also advance reconciliation uh, with Indigenous communities across the province and with Canada. Um, so in that capacity, I'm kind of excited to maybe shake the apple tree up here a little bit. <clears throat> Ron touched on it uh, a little bit. There's, there's immense, immense renewable and low carbon potential here in this province. It's essentially a function of land area and we have a lot of it here. And, and, so, and it's not just necessarily for renewable power. It's for um, what Rob was talking about uh, for renewable and low carbon gases. So leveraging our, our endowments of resources to produce low carbon energy carriers, energy commodities, and to really spread those benefits because they exist all over the province, to spread those benefits out to the different impacted communities and the and the and the and the of course the indigenous communities as well. So to just give you 
a sample of some of the stuff that we're working on. Um, we're currently evaluating and working with three different First Nations in the province to build out uh, RNG production, renewable natural gas from waste. So working with the Semiamu, <coughs> uh, the Seabird, and the Splatson. Uh, there's lots of co-benefits there. So uh, in the case of the Splatson, we can actually clean up an aquifer that's taking in agricultural waste that's kind of pouring in there. We can take that waste and actually produce a clean energy commodity. Uh, that'll you know help BC on that way, and, and just to say that Fortis BC is you know fully committed to this now. So uh, we just signed and acquired the largest ever RNG deal uh, globally two weeks ago. That was for eight petajoules, so an immense amount of energy. Uh, you know, uh, approximately five percent of the throughput on our system. So, so a huge amount of energy. We have now 30 RNG approved. Uh, with our regulator approved RNG supply contracts. And so we see lots of opportunity in that space. We obviously see a lot of opportunity pivoting because you know RNG, uh, traditional RNG from waste has a has a overall cap of how much you can use. It's just essentially how much waste you have in your province, which is a function of population. But then you can work into other sources, such as using forestry waste, so leveraging our forestry sector. Uh, there's interesting potential alignment with nature-based solutions in that realm to produce RNG or potentially hydrogen, leveraging our low carbon natural gas reserves, as Raw was just saying, and you know we're, we're pursuing right now a pyrolysis, a hydrogen pyrolysis project uh, in the province. We have about six hydrogen projects that we're evaluating right now. They're kind of, it's, it's somewhat early days. We're doing the, the feed, the pre-feed, all of that stuff. It's going to take some table setting. Uh, Rob talked about some of the challenges, but one of the things that we are absolutely convinced of is that this is an essential low carbon action for this province. Uh, why is that? Well, because um, we're, going to, uh, we're going to have a, a huge challenge, basically, endeavoring to drive our economy to net zero. Like We should not be under any um, illusions that this is basically the largest thing we have ever done as a society, as an industrial society, is transition our energy system. This is the most challenging thing we have ever done, and we ought to leave no stone unturned. And that means hydrogen gases, leveraging the gas system, thinking about the role that it can have. Moving on to LNG, uh, we own two LNG assets in the province. I'm not sure people know that. We have one that's 50 years old. <laughs> so, you know, half a century at, at Tilbury that has since been, it's in the process of being, re uh, we have a new facility there. We also have one uh, at Mount Hayes on uh, Vancouver Island. And these are used not for export right now. We're actually, we're using Tilbury, our new Tilbury facility for some export. Uh, but the Mount Hayes facility is used for peak shaving. And um, that was, you know, that was, I think, one of the first projects of its kind in the province, uh, energy projects, to have a f fundamental partnership with the local indigenous community, the Shemanis. They have an equity deal in, in that. And, you know, Fortis BC was, I, I, I want to believe, way out ahead of the curve in striking out that deal, striking out that partnership. And we see more opportunity there. We talked a little bit about the the low carbon advantage of LNG exports. Uh, you know, we've done a lot of work. I've done a lot of work. Specifically, we just actually published a paper uh, with our colleagues at UBC basically saying you get a two for one. You get two mission reductions for every, uh, two mission reductions in China, I should say, for every mission reduction that you increase here. And, you know, uh, we really ought to be mindful of the fact that Essentially, the challenge is the seven billion tons of emissions coming out of China's energy system. There's, there's two countries that really matter here, the United States and China. We should be under no illusions that this is where the challenge rests. And fundamentally, China still has in many respects what, what, look, what resembles a Victorian energy system, which is a system that is reliant on coal. Over half of energy consumption in industry in China, for example, is still coal. There are textile mills that have megawatt coal boilers to dry the fabrics. 
you know, located in heavy industrial areas. That is where the LNG is going. There are no options for those other industries, for example. There's no renewable power option of a megawatt sized boiler uh, for those industries in China. And we need to be highly mindful that reducing emissions now, today, is the challenge. Last year, we had record emissions globally. It continues to rise. We need never take our eye off the ball that net zero was the goal. But in fact, it is the challenge right now to bend that curve. And we need to employ every opportunity we have to do so. And so at Ford SPC, I just wanted to leave you with the fact that we are very excited by all of these opportunities to reduce emissions. We think they offer immense benefits for the province, for potential indigenous communities, and for the future, right? To, to decarbonize this province in a way that we see equitably, fairly, and advancing reconciliation. So just wanted to thank you and thank Alex for being a part of this initiative. Thank you very much, uh, Tyler. Um, inspiring words, uh, as always. Well, thank, and thank you. Uh, Rob Seeley was talking about energy density, and I think we should have been talking about information density. And so uh, appreciate your patience and, and concentration. Hopefully, you can see that uh, this initiative is trying to leave no stone unturned in trying to figure out how we get from where we are now not just in net zero, but actually beyond zero. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit towards the end. Um, and speaking of, uh, as I throw it open uh, to you to, to say what you'd like to say or ask whatever questions you would, um, we are where we are. Um, and, uh, and we are building uh, a pipeline uh, to Kitimat and uh, building an LNG plant in Kitimat that we need to get to net zero. Um, and so we have uh, someone in the audience from CGL um, who I told I was going to buttonhole him, and I am right now, um, to just you know provide a perspective uh, on shepherding one of the biggest investments in our history and how we're going to get from where we are now to that future. You've heard what we've had to say. We'd like to hear what you think of it. Um, and then, and then uh, for those of you that would like to make a comment or ask a question, please uh, just step up to the mic. Thanks. Go ahead, uh, Tom Sire from CGL. Yeah, definitely an uh, information-dense uh, panel. Thank you so much. Um, Alex, and, and thanks for, for the opportunity to just talk for a second about Coastal Gas Link and its role in our journey to, to make that, uh, a net zero commitment, which our company did, TC Energy, last year. It did make a net zero 2050 commitment. And, and now it's all about what are those pathways. Well, in the, the, the pathways, we've talked a lot about it already today. There's portfolio shifting. There's the, the, the move on the CCUS side. Um, for us at TC, we've already made some very significant commitments around hydrogen and uh, other work. But specifically to our project, uh, actually one of my other colleagues here, Kerry Booth, does a lot of work in this area with, with us as well. Um, I, I think the, 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 and I'm just going to focus in on, a, I think, a, an important comment that the FNCI is really kind of spearheading in this jurisdiction. Every jurisdiction has a different pathway, different risks, different opportunities to get to a net zero outcome. And I think that if we're going to be successful in this jurisdiction, um, it really is going to be to bolt onto ESG, ESGI, because everything we see in the energy space is going to need to be done either collaboratively or in the case of Coastal Gas Link, uh, we do now have uh, Indigenous equity partners that are going to be coming in, in addition to our, to our 20 agreements with nations uh, right across the, the corridor. So, you know, the, the kind of opportunity side that we've heard a whole bunch about today um, is definitely going to have to uh, continue to be that collaborative place with our Indigenous partners. Um, I think the, the kind of triple or, or double word score at a, at a minimum that we get out of a lot of this work though, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll give a lot of credit to, to the work that you've been doing on, on nature-based solutions. Um, the reality is, again, back to the every jurisdiction's pathway to net zero is different. It'll be very difficult for our project to electrify everything. So yes, we do have CCUS opportunities and other things, but we are going to more than likely need um, some form of offset nature-based solutions. There are myriad opportunities along that pipeline corridor to do MBS work. And you know we're very excited to be part of that and uh, 
Uh, Ron, you mentioned our, our government friends and, and their uh, new policy frameworks that they, they've got coming. There's certainly going to be really critical details that's going to help inform us on what that journey is going to look like, either from regulatory process or others, and we're certainly going to encourage them to continue engaging with the, with their other government partners, and that's the Indigenous uh, communities in, uh, you know, in, in this jurisdiction and, and elsewhere. So, Alex, I'm, I'm probably just going to stop there, but I, I did actually have one uh, question, actually, probably for, uh, maybe even for Tyler. In, in terms of some of the near-term opportunities that you see with our, our, our pipeline infrastructure, I, I, I think there's a, it, I wouldn't call it mythology, but I think there's a bit of a misunderstanding about just how quickly we can get our infrastructure turned over into hydrogen. Um, so maybe, a, uh, Rob, if you want to take a crack at that, if he's still on to as well. I think it's a really important part of that, that pathway conversation that we're talking about. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Tom. Tom. The, 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 um, uh, I swear you didn't, you didn't put, put you didn't launch me a softball, softball here. I didn't set this up, but I but I, I I've talked about this. You know, we it's a we need to think. Um, we need to use our imaginations here. And uh, well, what I say, it's like it's a it's a bankrupt imagination to think that the gas system, that network of pipelines, like a highly valuable piece of infrastructure itself, cannot align with our low carbon future. And just as you know, we had to huge problem in the electricity sector in the 90s and the early 2000s with emissions. We, we endeavored to address that. We invested in the technologies. What I like to say is, you know, in 2000, there was about 800 megawatts of solar capacity installed worldwide, right? Now there's over eight gigawatts, you know, 80,000 gigawatts, you know, of, uh, sorry, 80,000, 80 gigawatts of solar, excuse me, installed, right? And so, that same trajectory, there's nothing essentially different about something like hydrogen that, that is not amenable to that same type of growth, you know? And we just recently published a study, we partnered with the provincial government and we partnered with the BC Bioenergy Network to answer this question. Geez, just how much renewable and low carbon gas is out there in BC? You know, like answer that question. It's always been, ah, oh, there's not enough. You know, it's just a couple of landfills and that's it. And we said, well, let's just actually take a look at it. Let, let's, let's look at what Rob was talking about here. Like, let's look at these technologies. Let's refresh all of this. Lo and behold, uh, we had a consultant do it. They came back, this report's on our website as well. And they said, uh, actually, taking a look at technology development over the past five years, it looks like there's more than double of your load available for renewable and low carbon gas production in this province alone. You know, that's gonna, there's a lot of barriers to, to realize that. I'm not saying it's gonna be a cakewalk or anything like that, but just in terms of the raw potential, there's that much. And so, again, we owe it to ourselves to kind of think about this. Geez, how does this system align for that, for that future? Like, what role could it have beyond simply saying, oh, it, it has no role, let's walk away from it. No, there's gonna be, Huge challenges with that. I, I could talk to your ear off about that, but I won't. Um, but just to say that, you know, there, there is that innate greenhouse gas reduction potential built into the gas system through the fuels it can deliver. Thank yeah, you. Maybe, Thank you, Tyler. Could, Go ahead. Could I add a, just a comment? Maybe um, back to the question, uh, the speed of transition for utilization of pipelines uh, for hydrogen. I think... My, my take on it is that, and I did mention this in my um, presentation, that for long distance transport, we should continue to move the molecules as natural gas. If we're gonna build a 600 or seven or 800 kilometer hydrogen pipeline, well, I can tell you it's gonna be all stainless steel, metallurgy 320, 321, whatever, and it's going to be very, very expensive. So, but why not just continue to use the pipelines we have moving natural gas to the location where we need hydrogen and then we manufacture it there. So for long distances, we should be just using gas pipelines to move gas. If we're going to have a short distribution system, maybe call it in cities. Now we're, we're, we're moving things around 10, 20, 50. That's a different scenario. Then we can build hydrogen distribution network in a high stainless metallurgy um, 
I had the opportunity to build one in Scottford in uh, North Saskatchewan area, 100 kilometer hydrogen pipeline. And yep, it was all stainless steel. <laughs> anyway, so th that's my take on the whole pipeline thing. There's um, blending of hydrogen into carbon steel pipes designed for natural gas. I, uh, that'll be very, very challenging. Yeah, so well, we need to keep these things separate if we can. Thank you both. Um, I think we have a couple of questions from our virtual audience um, or comments. Uh, I think Shanda's going to enlighten us to what they are. Yes, we have. Hello. We have two online questions, and I think there's only about eight minutes left in this session. So I'll just read them both, and uh, maybe we could just spend two minutes on each. Uh, so this is probably for Ron or Tyler. Is there potential for partnerships with the forest industry to supply biomass for bioenergy, reducing the need for slash burning and incentivizing wildfire risk mitigation by reducing fuel loads? And as you're thinking about that, uh, the second question, smaller industrial projects, including LNG facilities that are coming online, struggle with capacity and expertise to develop, implement, net zero plans, any advice on how to facilitate info sharing and collaboration with more established players? Okay, well I can tackle the first question about bioenergy. The answer is yes, and it was identified in, uh, in, my, in my talk. Um, there is waste wood in, in Northwest British Columbia that could be used for producing electricity and heat. Um, there's not a huge amount though that's cost effective because a lot of the waste fiber is going into pellets for export typically to, to Europe. And um, scavenging the waste wood out of the forest is, uh, can be really costly. Certainly um, that should be done to um, reduce fire, uh, wildfire risk for communities. Um, but that, that has a different risk reduction lens than actual cost. So going to the forest to get waste wood, to use it for energy, it's tough to get that to pencil in a low cost way. But it's a good, it's certainly out there. I'll, I'll offer the uh, slightly amended perspective of yes, there is huge potential for waste wood. Ron's th thinking about the, the global LNG trade with its very tight margins, but here in BC we have something called the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Regulation, which allows us to acquire renewable low carbon gases up to $30 a gigajoule. We're the only jurisdiction in North America with an enabling legislation like that. And so when you, when you have that type of cap, or that type of cost perspective, then in fact, a lot of that forestry waste, uh, the slash pilings, does look like it's cost effective. And in fact, um, almost three quarters of our load, so uh, about, of, when I say load, I mean all the gas or energy that we deliver to our customers, our million customers for their furnaces, water heaters, so on and so forth, almost three quarters of that could be replaced with, uh, with kind of forestry waste repurposing the, the pellet mills, using the tenures from the pellet mills to producing clean energy commodities here in BC, for example, leveraging our, our pulp and paper sector with the opportunities that they have to produce both renewable natural gas, syn gases, and hydrogen. So, in fact, this is a, this is a pretty much an un, uncorked bottle right now uh, in terms of what the opportunity could be for renewable gas or renewable energy in this province. Okay, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Shanda. Who wants to tackle the second question? You might have to repeat it. Brother. Sure. Uh, so it's about smaller um, LNG facilities and other industrial projects that need to reach net zero. And so in terms of implementing and developing the plans to do so, is there any advice on how to facilitate info sharing and collaboration with more established players to provide that level of expertise? I can take a stab at that. Um, and in regards to the Cedar LNG project, 
I can't speak on their behalf, they're not here, uh, but in their consultation with Heisla, um, even the fact that it's a Heisla driven project, we have, Heisla have set right from day one that it's going to be um, using hydroelectric power. So that in itself will reduce emissions. Um, and I, I, we did meet with um, the Indigenous uh, liaison yesterday and he mentioned they are working on their net zero plan. So there is capacity within these smaller projects and I don't know what Silicons is working on, but we have them working with us on the nature-based solutions steering committee. So they're engaged and um, that's about all uh, the most insight I can put into that question. You know, maybe I could kind of slip out of my moderator role for a second and, and say simply, uh, you could join the FNCI collaboration um, because that's exactly what we're trying to do is share information and the door is open and it's free. Um, and we are uh, trying to unearth the best ideas we can. I see there's another question and then we're gonna have to wrap. Go ahead. Not a question, but I just wanna bring an idea. We spoke about the problem, sorry, JP Bayangos from Shell Nature Based Solutions. Uh, we spoke about uh, the difficulty of bringing biomass from the forest area, uh, th those, those dead woods. Um, I just want to share about a venture called Takachar. It's a VC venture. Apparently they are able to um, build a very novel concept of oxygen lean torrification, um, where they have remote, uh, remote uh, hauling capacity Literally, like you know, in, in trucks, they they haul biomass and they could, sorry, about biomass from the forest and and have it have it process. So something that we could take a look into to resolve the the problem on on biomass. So the company name is Takachar. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm just about to turn the mic over to Candice uh, to bring this to a conclusion. Uh, I really want to thank uh, the sponsors. Uh, that for this session, um, Carbon Streaming and Enbridge and Silisms and Cedar, and uh, really appreciate um, them. And and they are also sponsors. And there's a whole bunch more of the event we're holding in June. And you'll see a green postcard on the on the table in front of you. If you pick up that postcard and scan the QR code, you'll get all the information you need. Uh, about that event, um, and I can I can almost promise that it won't be as information dense as this one. Um, I guarantee that it will be interesting. Um, two of the companies, one of the companies that Rob mentioned um, in his presentation, Monolith, um, we've been in touch with them. We've asked them to come and speak, uh, and they're interested. As is a company here in Vancouver that's doing the same thing, in a slightly different way, Acona. Um, so we're trying to bring people together that are trying to solve these problems, uh, recognizing what a lot of people have said is it's going to take every solution we can find to get from where we are to where we need to get to. So thanks for uh, joining us on June 7th, if in fact you can. And uh, to close, uh, I'm going to ask Candice uh, to say some final words. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the GLOBE employees for uh, getting us here today and making things go so smoothly. Much appreciated. I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us and sharing your time with us. The presentations are an introduction and they're a progress report and an indication of what's to come. We hope to expand our collaboration even, even further as Alex mentioned, and we invite you to join us uh, for the virtual conference on June 7th. We have named this event Beyond Zero First Nations leadership for a recovering climate because net zero is not a destination. It is a milestone on our journey and we need to get there soon. Thank you. <laughs>